This is Whiskey Whereabouts. I'm Tim, and this is part one of my ranking of every distillery in Speyside that fits my criteria. I can't rank all the distilleries in Speyside. There's like 49 of them, and well, more than half of them go into blends. So I had to come up with a system. So what is the system? Which distilleries are in the mix? Who's number one? Who's last? My whiskey journey has taken me to Scotland and back. I've explored whiskey education, tastings, and distilleries from Isla to Speyside. And now my journey continues here, with you, on Whiskey Whereabouts. So like I said, there's so many distilleries in Speyside, and so many of them primarily produce whiskey that goes into blends. But a lot of them have one official bottling for a lot of the Diageo distilleries go into their blends. It's that Flora and Fauna series. Sometimes uh, they'll even be two official bottlings. So I had to draw a line somewhere to make this manageable. So we had a manageable number of distilleries to rank that had enough um, bottles on their own, uh, official bottlings, not independent bottlings, that we could actually evaluate them with criteria. So I made the rule, you need to have three core range official bottlings or more to make the cut. So limited releases did not count. Uh, regional releases did not count. Travel retail does not count. And if all you have is a flora and fauna, then it doesn't count. You need three. So what did that do to the 49 distilleries that we had to work with? It cut these distilleries are primarily um, there to produce whiskey that goes into blends, give or take a single official bottling, a flora and fauna, a distiller's edition, or the like. And so there's one notable distillery on this list, and it is Longmorn, a distillery uh, that has its fans, but it only has two official non-limited release bottlings. And as a result, if I let Longmorn in, I would have had to have let Kim Envy and Tormor and Glen Bergie, and there's just too many of them. I can't do one of these lists without an honorable mention, right? So we do have one honorable mention uh, of the 24 remaining distilleries. And that honorable mention is the Brave All Distillery. And this is a distillery that primarily produces whiskey that goes into blends, but it has three official releases. So it would qualify for the list, except they have incredibly high age statements on these official releases. I mean, 25, 30 years, high ABV. They're very rare. They're incredibly expensive. I haven't had any of them. I wouldn't know where to start to rank them. So let's just acknowledge that this distillery is there, that it would have qualified uh, otherwise and call it the honorable mention. How are we going to rank them? The same rules are going to apply. And I am going to rank the distilleries based on their core range of offerings. So what is going to be persuasive? The quality of the whiskey, obviously. The presentation of the whiskey will be uh, considered. The breadth of the core range. More variety is going to help boost your ranking and value counts. So if you are uh, looking at distilleries with similar offerings, the relative value of those bottles is going to uh, factor in where I place them on the list. Good news for Spayburn, bad news for McAllen. So let's get started ranking our 23 distilleries. And let's get started with the two distilleries I have ranked in a tie, Dufftown and Glen Doolin. And each of these distilleries produces whiskey for Diageo. But Diageo has also designated each of them to produce single malt whiskey that they market under the Singleton brand, except the distillery producing Singleton in the UK and in North America is not the same. So Dufftown produces Singleton whiskey, marketed as the Singleton of Dufftown for the UK market. Glendulin produces the Singleton for the US, the North American market. They each have three age statement whiskeys, 12, 15, 18. They're all 40%. They're all terribly presented. This is a brand that has been uh, engineered by Diageo as a sort of entry level um, distillery uh, uh, brand of a single malt for 
frankly, non-experienced Scotch whiskey drinkers. Scotch whiskey drinkers who aren't ready for the other Diageo sort of core range uh, entry level whiskey, especially the 43% whiskeys. So this is whiskey that um, you and I don't really have much use for and don't pay much attention to. Uh, and so it is absolutely last on the list. Okay, next up, Camnavulin. This is a distillery, again, that markets uh, single malt whiskeys. They have uh, a lot, more than three in their core range. They are primarily known for marketing 40% non-age statement, single malt whiskeys, uh, a lot of which have some sort of wine cask finish. Um, the double cask, I think, is the most common one. Chill filtered, color added, 40%. Again, this is really sort of basic, watered down stuff. Okay, next up, the biggest distillery that we've talked about so far, Diageo Strikes Again. We're going to Cardew, and so Cardew is uh, marketed as a sort of Johnny Walker Visitor Center for the tourists um, in Speyside. They're one of the four corners of Johnny Walker, end quote, that Diageo set up these big elaborate visitor centers in four of the five regions, um, signifying um, that this is a distillery that's producing a lot of whiskey that goes into the Johnny Walker blend, but giving, you know, tourists um, a place to visit um, that is that is anchored around the sort of Johnny Walker brand. And they actually have a pretty robust, it's not like they have just one core range bottom. They have uh, three age statements, two non-age statement whiskeys. It's all 40% and it's all, you know, terribly presented. So that's why we're here at this point on the list. Next up, Glen Murray. I almost forgot to slot Glen Murray uh, into the first draft of the list because it's Glen Murray. It's the most basic sort of budget whiskey. Um, there's like six non-age statement whiskeys here in this um, core range. There's like five age statements. There's different finishes. There's even a peated variant. This is all, you know, 40%, a lot of non-age statement whiskeys on a budget. Very budget price. You're not getting anything spectacular for the money. There is one sort of uh, kind of diamond in the rough here in this core range. There is an 18 year with a proper age statement. It's 47 0.3%. I think it's not chill filtered, maybe still color added. You're getting that 18 year age statement. It's not the best whiskey you've ever had, but you're getting it probably for less than $120, which is a decent budget. Let's talk about the largest volume distillery in terms of single malt whiskey uh, that we're going to talk about on the list, and it is Glenfiddich time. And Glenfiddich is a huge player in this space, and they have a very long list of core range whiskeys age statements from 12 year all the way up to 50. Uh, the reasonable sort of sub 20 year age statement core range whiskeys. Uh, they're all 40%, they're all chill filtered, they're all sort of color added, terribly presented. This is, you know, what we think of as, as sort of entry level sort of whiskey uh, into the world of Scotch whiskey, right? In, ter in terms of single malt. And it has never been my favorite. I don't, I don't have a lot of fond uh, in my early days, I wasn't a Glenfiddich um, drinker, and I don't have a real appreciation of the Glenfiddich spirit. And so it's coming in here um, for lack of any other sort of quality to give it a, a boost. Okay, so if Glenfiddich is the King Kong of Speyside Single Malt Whiskey, let's talk about Godzilla. Glenlivet is the sort of counterpart to the Glenfiddich uh, in this space, right? These are the two sort of titans um, selling so much single malt whiskey the world over. Every bar you go into, right? Every shop you go into is going to have some core range offerings from these two distilleries. And I rank Glenlivet slightly above Glenfiddich for two reasons. Number one, this was my sort of entry in to the world of single malt scotch whiskey, Glenlivet 12 year, on the rocks. Talking about it right now, that was the, that was my first sort of scotch whiskey, and I can just I can recall exactly sort of what that tastes like. Completely washed out, uh, the sort of apple kind of orchard fruit and cask notes, kind of all that's sort of remaining. Incredibly watered down, forty percent whiskey. But that was my entry point. So it has sort of bonus points to me personally. You may be able to relate, but. Also, I just think the Glenlivet spirit, before it is gone through this process and being terribly, terribly presented so that 
Glenlivet can sell tons and tons and tons of bottles of it, um, is pretty solid. And uh, for evidence, I would point to any number of sort of single cask Glenlivets that you can get as distillery exclusives that are robust, that are high quality, that are rewarding whiskeys that they could sell if they wanted to, but they're too busy making money doing what they're doing. Checking in at number 17, next we're gonna talk about the distillery on this list that has the absolute worst SEO branding of any of these distilleries. The Speyside Distillery which is almost ungoogleable because of all the other results you're going to get that markets actually two brands of single malt and one is called Spay. And so this is not that old of a distillery. They've been around for a little bit more than 30 years, like 19, early 1990s, a core range of non age statement whiskeys that sort of ranges. There's a 40% whiskey, there's 46% whiskeys. And so this is not a whiskey that is very common, especially here in the US, um, but it is one that is attempting to provide us with well-presented whiskey, even though they lack age statements, edging it above some of the sort of big uh, volume, um, basic entry-level presentation distilleries that we've been talking about so far. Next up, 16, Tom and Tool Distillery. They've got non-age statement whiskeys. They've got age statements. They've got 10 year whiskey all the way up to 25 year whiskey. They've got a cigar malt. They have a separate peated range, the old Ballantrin range with nice 50% robust ABV peated whiskeys. Um, several of these whiskeys are 40%, it's 43% whiskey. There appears to be no rhyme or reason. Um, 14 years, 46%. There's a higher age statement whiskey. There's a 40% whiskey. There's some whiskeys in here that are worthwhile, that are decently presented. So I'm putting it here. Um, we are working our way up the ladder. Okay, moving on to number 15. Next up, Glenrothes. I will be honest with you, this is not a distillery that I've ever really had a lot of love for. Um, they have a core range that is pretty weak, 40% uh, whiskey at the lower sort of age statement end of the range. The higher range, if you get to 18, I think this is 25. I think you get 43%. So not very well presented. Um, how has it sort of edged out the last couple on the list? Well, it's because of one single bottling that they offer and it's called the Whiskey Maker's Cut. And it's a 48.8% non-age statement whiskey. So now we've got some actual robust whiskey here. Problem with that whiskey is not the quality as much as the price tag. This is a bottle that's gonna cost you $100. And as we climb this list, we're gonna encounter some non-age statement Sherry Bomb whiskeys from multiple distilleries, okay? That are gonna come in well north of 50%. Cast strength, 60%. Um, I, I know you know at least one of them that I'm thinking of. We're going to get there in the same price point. So even if we've got a whiskey that's sort of intriguing and, and pretty robust here, Despite the non-age statement, it is a little overpriced without the age statement to back it up. So this is where we land. Next up, Glen Grant. So many Glens, right? And here we have Glen Grant that is going to offer us a core range with age statements, with non-age statements, with 40% whiskey, with 43% whiskey. Uh, again, sort of mixed bag, not nearly how well presented that we'd like it to be, but batch strength 50% whiskey with a 15 year age statement that is largely available in the same neighborhood as the $100 that we just talked about. Again, now I'm getting a similar 50%, but I'm getting a, a, a nice robust age statement on this to back up the price tag. So that brings us to number 13 in our rankings. This is going to be the final distillery in the bottom half of the rankings. After I reveal the next distillery, we will be at the exact halfway point. But before I do, I want to point out that uh, the last time I checked before I filmed this video, we were about, we were getting very close to 1,750 subscribers on the channel. Thank you to everybody subscribed so far. When we get to 2,000, I have uh, something special planned. I have a special bottle that I've been saving for a while that I'm going to open. I'm going to share with you. I don't want to reveal exactly what it is and what uh, we're going to be sort of comparing it to. I will just say that it involves Lagavulin, Cast Strength Whiskey, and Mexico. So when we get to 2000, 
We're going to have that special episode. So if you haven't subscribed, please make sure you do so we can reach our goal. And in the meantime, uh, let's talk about what the final distillery in this uh, sort of bottom first half is going to be. We've got a lot of big distilleries still out in the field. We've got 14 distilleries and one of them isn't going to make the cut. And this is the moment that I'm going to place McAllen. And McAllen is a distillery that has a very broad sort of core range. There's a lot of nice age statements uh, in, in categorized multiple cast configurations. And the problem with McAllen is not that it is terrible, it is that it is a terrible value. We've got a lot of 40%, 43% chill filtered whiskey here. No color added at McAllen, great job. McAllen, but we are talking about a sort of a distillery uh, at number sort of 13 here that probably represents the worst value in Speyside single malt scotch whiskey. And yet here we are at number 13, right at the middle. We, we, have, we have reached the halfway point with this distillery. And I think that's about right. I think that's where this distillery belongs. The whiskeys are not terrible. They're just not uh, good value. And so I, it's really held back from uh, trying to, to get in the mix with the top half of the distilleries, in part because of the poor presentation, but mostly because of the poor value. So that is the end of part one of my ranking of the Speyside distilleries. This is all very subjective. The very rules and structures I came up with uh, to, to set this up are subjective. So are my rankings. That's uh, how it's gonna be. Let me know in the comments um, where you would place the different distilleries we talked about. If you have any ideas of how the rankings are gonna shake out in the top half when that episode is coming. Make sure that if you haven't subscribed, that you definitely do. Use that big button that's going to pop up over here so you don't miss part two, where we have the top half of the Speyside single malt distillery rankings, and make sure you help us reach our goal so I can have that special episode. I'll see you on the next one.